Discover the power of one. I could tell you a lot about the military, um, but I want to show you a couple of videos here that will say more than I can possibly say, but I want to tee them up first. And during the Vietnam War, as you know, we had a lot of prisoners of war. You know that they went through a very brutal experience, and some of them were there as much as eight years. And uh, we found out a lot after they were released uh, in March of 73. They had a miserable experience. They were tortured daily by their captors, the North Vietnamese. But they, with very few exceptions, they stood strong. And I want to show you a video right now of a a guy named Admiral Jeremiah Denton who eventually became a senator from the state of Alabama. And I want you to realize that before he made this statement that he's about to make, he was tortured for months. It's against the Geneva Convention to force a prisoner of war to make a public statement, particularly one on camera or sign anything. They tortured Jeremiah Denton for months, and then they this is what he said when they forced him to make a statement. Can you show the video? Former Alabama Senator and prisoner of war Jeremiah Denton has died. Denton is probably best known as the POW who let his eyes do the talking during a 1966 interview from North Vietnam, where he was held for seven and a half years. Unbeknownst to his captors, Denton blinked the word torture in Morse code, alerting the U.S. government to conditions in the communist North. What he went on to say was, I don't know my government's policies, but I still support my government. It was 1968. He blinked in Morse code the word torture. He was ultimately the key to allowing the intelligence community to know that our prisoners were being tortured in Hanoi. And as a result of that, knowing that we had to do something, we launched a raid in 1970 called the, the Sante Raid as we sent Americans in to try and bring our prisoners out. A man of great courage, a man that was prepared to be a prisoner of war because the military prepared him for this very thing. Now, I want you to look at another video, two videos, as a matter of fact. They were 2016, January of this year, when two patrol boats were taken off the coast of Iran. And by the way, they were in international waters. They were not in Iranian waters, but they were in international waters, they were taken by the Iranians, and the commander was a 2011 Naval Academy graduate. And I want you to watch this video. It was a mistake. That was our fault, and we apologize for our mistake. The Iranian behavior was fantastic while we were here. We thank you very much for your hospitality and your assistance. Does that tell you anything about the condition of our military? It says more than I can say to you up here in the next hour. What happened to the warrior ethos, the warrior spirit? You think our enemies are not laughing at us with this kind of stuff? Now, this guy has since been disciplined, but this is a Naval Academy graduate, just like Jeremiah Denton was. This man and his whole crew went into combat unprepared. They went into a hostile territory unprepared because they were never given the right training on the code of conduct. Code of conduct is what you drill people on before you put them into a hostile area. And it's about how you are able to behave. It's what the requirements, the U.S. military requirements, the, the Geneva Convention, it's all about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And here you got a Naval Academy graduate not only apologizing to the Iranians, but thanking them for their hospitality. If I sound angry this morning, it's because I am. I spent almost 37 years in this military, and it is frustrating me beyond what I can explain to you this morning of what's happening to our military. But I'll guarantee you that guy and his whole crew never missed one class on diversity or inclusion or integration or sexual harassment or white privilege. They never missed one of those classes. 
They got all those classes. I talk to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines all the time to say, sir, you won't believe it. We spend so much time in the classroom. And by the way, some of the things that they get trained on, and I've got videos to show this and photographs, are the kinds of things that throw up the Family Research Council or the American Family Association on a slide, and they say, and if you're associated with these people, you're risking a court-martial. Oh, yeah. Some of you have probably seen that and heard of it, but we caught them in the act, training soldiers by telling them they couldn't be associated with American Family Association or the Family Research Council. These young men and women in our military today are telling me all the time we are wasting so much time. We sit in the classroom because every time there's a social experiment, a package comes with it. It's a training package, and you better believe that that commander that apologized to the Iranians, none of his sailors ever missed one of those classes, and the reason is because their commander's efficiency report was based on 100% participation in every one of these classes about these social experiments. We have the most experienced military today that we've ever had in American history. And we are absolutely destroying it. We've been at war since 2001. It's the most experience we've ever had. It's longer than Vietnam. And we're destroying it. You know, the way you do a military budget is you start with an assessment of the enemy. What are our future threats? What can we expect to be up against? A nuclear-armed Iran, a nuclear-armed uh, North Korea, an emerging Russian military, an emerging Chinese military, and the ever-present and global ISIS and other Islamic threats. Once you've identified what your threats are, you then make a conscious decision as to what risk you're willing to take. And then you build a budget around those threats and the risk that you're willing to take. We didn't do that. Our brilliant leadership in Washington, and that's not just the president and his administration, it's the Congress, both houses of the Congress, both the House and the Senate, came up with this brilliant idea called sequestration. And they cut so deeply into our military that today, by the time the cuts are finished, our Army will be down to pre-World War II levels, our Navy will be down to pre-World War II levels, and our Air Force will be the lowest that it's ever been since it was created in 1947. Now I want you to look around the world, look at the threats that we're facing today and tell me, does it make sense to you that at the same time that our enemies are increasing, that the threat to America is increasing, we're reducing our capabilities, and then what's really disgusting about this is both the military and the civilian leadership within the Department of Defense look into the cameras and say, oh, but we're going to be a strong military. And nobody believes them. Nobody believes them. Certainly not the young men and women that are serving beneath them. They don't believe them. They know that they're just standing up there looking in the cameras and lying. But the Congress will not do anything about it. I just uh, was in Oklahoma and I talked to one of the members of Congress uh, two days ago uh, on the Armed Services Committee and I said, if you don't, if you don't stop this erosion, then your children and my grandchildren are going to pay the price for this. And he, he said, we are trying hard now to stop the reduction of our military, the destruction of our military. And I hope that he will follow through with what he says he's going to do. You know, we've, we've had the equipment that's been at war in both Iraq and Afghanistan for since 2001. And we don't even have the money to replace all that equipment. So we have units. We have combat units that don't have the equipment that they need. And I don't know how many of you saw the uh, Fox News special about the Marine Corps and how they're having to cannibalize airplanes to keep other airplanes flying because we don't have the money to buy the parts. Where's all that money going? 
Where's that money going? Draw your own conclusions. Cannibalizing airplanes in a day like this with a, a country like America, as Russia is building its military, China is building its military. By the way, China will give, will soon have the most modern aircraft carrier that the world's ever known. And by the way, China is building, literally building islands and making air runways and seaports on these islands out in the South China Sea. What do you think they're doing? They're just setting up, you know, fishing trips out there? Or I don't think so. China has an expansionist view of the world today. And our military readiness is shrinking. You know, Douglas MacArthur stood in the mess hall at West Point. In 1963, and I, it's, it's interesting for those of you who have been there, and you look up at this little perch that he stood in as he addressed the entire student body at West Point, but he said something very important in there. He said, your mission is fixed, constant, inviolable. It is to fight and win the nation's wars. That's the only mission that our military has, fight and win wars. It is not about social experiments. It's not supposed to be. It's to fight and win wars. And the question then is, when's the last time we won a war? You see, we've got a generation of people in our military today that don't know what it means to win because they haven't won. They haven't won. They don't know what it means to win a war. Think about it. I mean, we've been, at, we've been at war for 15 years now. You've got an awful lot of people that are now up in the mid-grades of our military, and they've never won a war. The last war we actually won was the first Gulf War. But the last major war that we won was World War II. And now just think about the men and women that are in our military that don't know what winning means because they haven't had the leadership. They haven't had the political or the military leadership to actually be able to win. Morale is low in our military today. Two nights ago, I was in Oklahoma. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there was a young Army recruiter there at the event that I was at, and I just uh, I talked to him for a few minutes, and I said, uh, how's the recruiting going? This is in Oklahoma, a patriotic state. Maybe, one of, maybe, maybe the most conservative state in the union. All 77 counties in that state last time voted Republican. And he said, sir, he said, we're struggling. I said, what's the, what's the problem? He said, people don't want to come in the military anymore because they're watching very closely what's happening in our military. Our recruiting of all the services, it's not just the Army it's all the services is a real struggle. And I talked to a three-star, a retired three-star that did a study for the military to try and figure out why they were struggling with recruiting. And I thought, I can tell you why you're struggling with recruiting. I, don't, I won't even charge you for the study. I'll just give you the answer. The morale is low, and you get a lot of good people leaving the military. And then you got some really poor leadership at the top of our military. You know, well, just think about this. When the chief of staff of the Army or the commandant of the Marine Corps stands up and looks in the camera and says, oh, I believe we can put women in infantry units and special operations units with no problems, or I don't believe that putting transgenders into the military is going to have any negative impact, it's only going to be positive, do you think that anybody below them believes that they believe what they're saying. Now, what does that do to the leadership of our military? It discredits the senior echelons of our military. So the hardest thing to fix is now those young leaders, those sergeants, those lieutenants, those captains and majors that are looking up the line at the senior leadership of our military, watching them lie, knowing that they're lying, knowing that they know you know they're lying about this kind of stuff. But that's what they see. They see they don't see warriors at the top. They don't see people with the warrior ethos. They don't see people that are there to win, that are going to lead them to victory. What they see is a bunch of sycophants, 
a bunch of people that are there because they're willing to support these radical policies. They're not leaders. They're not warriors. And now you're breeding a generation that's coming up behind them thinking, that's what I have to do. So the focus is not on winning. The focus is not on defeating the enemy. The focus is on a radical agenda that is destroying our military. You look at the social experiments, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, women in the infantry, transgender integration, and all of these things. By the way, do you know that uh, in 2013, the Army study, depending on which one of the Army studies you read, somewhere between 53 and 56 percent of the sexual assaults that were reported were men on men. Do you know that? But everything's working okay, trust me. I mean, everything's okay. And then you put them into combat and you, you give them rules of engagement that not only does not allow them to win with these rules of engagement, but it jeopardizes their lives. And their morale just continues to shrink. It goes lower and lower. Come on, you got to be shot at before you can return fire. Come on, you got a target identified and you can't take that target out for some peculiar reason. You can't take that target out. So they go into battle wanting to win, but they're not allowed to win because of the prohibitions that are put on them. And then you want to add real insult to it. These people that they capture and put in get mode, now we're turning them loose and letting them go right back to the battlefield. Do you think that doesn't devastate their morale? They ask, the, I mean, it's just like the cop on the beat. He arrests some drug dealer, puts him, takes him down to city hall, and they fingerprint him and let him go. It's the same devastating thing. We just uh, can't keep doing this. And probably the thing that is destroying our military the most is the all-out assault on religious liberty. We have a, I, th I saw it out there, uh, we have a pamphlet out there, and one of the tables is called A Clear and Present Danger, where we put together at the Family Research Council uh, uh, this thing to lay out for you exactly what's happening in our military with regards to uh, the assault on religious liberty. Clear and present danger. We document cases of infringement on religious liberties all over the military. The latest one is right here at Peterson Air Force Base. How many of you have heard about this one? A major had an open Bible on his desk. Right? Somebody complained. And they made him take the Bible off his desk. What? Are you serious? Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble, to petition their government for the redress of grievances. That is all about religious liberty. It is all about religious liberty. It's not about the freedom of worship. It's about the freedom of religion. And you, I, I want you to stop and think in the context of what I just said, in the context of what you just saw, somebody at a military base is afraid of a Bible? Well, we've got all these enemies that are real threats to America. Oh, it's a weapon. There's no question. It's the most powerful weapon there is. But it is not a threat. And we've got people that are supposed to be warriors, that are supposed to be focused on fighting and winning this nation's wars, and they're worried about an open Bible on somebody's desk. That's where we are, folks. You better pray for this military. You better pray that we get a president, a commander-in-chief that understands the importance of restoring this military. On the 3rd of October, I'm, going to, I'm bringing 275 people together in Washington to meet with Donald Trump, and this is what we're going to talk to him about. And I'm going to show him that video. Sergeant Philip Monk, 19 years of service at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, was the first sergeant of a training unit, and his commander, who happened to be a lesbian, said, I need you to tell me that you support same-sex marriage. And Sergeant Monk simply said this, based on my religious convictions, ma'am, 
I can't give you the answer you want, therefore I don't want to answer the question. She relieved him on the spot, humiliated him, kicked him out of the unit, wouldn't even let him clear his wall locker out, said, we'll bring your stuff to you. Well, let me tell you, we fought that one. We got Liberty Institute out of Texas to defend him, and ultimately I went out and retired him in San Antonio, Texas a year ago this past January, and the, the base in San Antonio recognized him as the non-commissioned officer of the quarter. <laughs> Marine Sergeant, actually Marine Lance Corporal Manifa Sterling had a, had a scripture on her workstation. You know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And they court-martialed her for it. Told her to take it down. She said, I have a, I have a constitutional right. I said, take it down. They court-martialed her and kicked her out of the Marine Corps for it. Boy, that was another threat, wasn't it? Chaplain Lawhorn at Fort Benning, Georgia, in a suicide prevention class, when it came his turn to tell how he dealt with periods of depression, he said, Scripture. He said, here's a couple of scriptures that I use. That's my way of dealing with it. It's called in on Thanksgiving Day by his commander, his brigade commander, and issued an official letter of reprimand. I was supposed to speak at Fort Riley, Kansas on D-Day, voluntary prayer breakfast. I got a call two days ahead of time that said the The commander has canceled your visit because you are too controversial. No, you know what he did? He infringed on the religious liberties of every every man and woman, whether they were a soldier or a civilian, that wanted to come to a voluntary prayer breakfast. He infringed on their rights. The rights of our young men and women are being infringed every single day. And Chaplain Wes Motter, in two weeks, three weeks, I'll go to, (coughs) I'll go out and retire Chaplain Motter, Chaplain at uh, Navy Base in Charleston, South Carolina. Young Naval Academy graduate came in and wanted counseling. What do you think about homosexuality? He gave him a biblical answer. Came in the next day, what do you think about marriage, same-sex marriage? He gave him a biblical answer. Third time that young man came in, he had the equal opportunity people with him, and a note from the commander that said, Chaplain Motter, you are relieved of all duties, and you must show cause as to whether we should even allow you to stay in the U.S. Navy. He had four years in the Marine Corps and 15 years as a chaplain in the Navy, and they wanted him to show cause. Now... That's another good news story because we fought that one hard, and Chaplain Motter was restored, and his commander that relieved him was discovered to be involved in an adulterous affair, and he was put out of the Navy in shame. Harm not my anointed. (laughs) Moms and dads all over this country are concerned about our military, and I, I must tell you, it's becoming more and more difficult for me to look a mom and dad in the eye and say, I think you should let your son and daughter serve. It's become more and more difficult. I'm so proud of my service. And, you know, Pastor Cowart said it last night. I do. I carry a constitution with me. I took an oath to this. I carry it with me everywhere I go. I read it. I read it on airplanes. I can, I can recite major portions of it because I do. I love this country. But I'll tell you, I'm worried about our military. I'm worried about the young men and women that are stepping forward and saying, here am I, send me. Only to get in and find out they have to leave their faith at the door or they're forced into participating in things that they find objectionable just to be able to serve their country. That's not right. We got to stand with them. We got to Stand firm with them. We've got to put leaders in the House and the Senate and the White House that will respect our young men and women, not only while they're serving, but when they become veterans. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.